welcome to the Dread Cassette, a horror cast by Darker Days Radio. Uh, I'm your hostess, Sam, and I'm here with Chris. Hello. And Crystal. Hello. Uh, how are we all doing today? Uh, it is one year since I started ha- posting memes about COVID. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm right there with you. It, that's a bit, a bit of a strange feeling. One. Yep. Uh, otherwise, what have we done? Painted, painted a hallway black and put up horror m- horror movie posters. Yep, looks great. Looks fucking awesome. Um, done a lot of gaming. We did virtual horror con, which was horror gaming and how to get into the industry and stuff. That was really fun. Uh, we watched. We did how uh, Howard Ingham did his release of um, uh, it's cults and something. Yes, it's about cults. It's a follow up to it to to Howard's book on um on uh folk horror, and uh, Howard ran a, uh, a a a party watch for um what was it the invitation which the is invitation's awesome. The invitation's a great movie. I love it. Um, what other news can I think of that's interesting or things we have been up to? Uh, I died. Well, no, I'm not technically. I don't think I'm technically dead in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay yet, but I'm out of it for now and start something new. Um, what other movies have been good to watch or, or things that we are going to watch? Is it The Terror that's on BBC right now? Uh, yeah, I'm really interested in watching that. So Jared Harris is in it. Uh, mm. I know him from Mad Men and lots of other things. Yes. Um. Yeah, and it's sort of it's it's based on sort of historical fiction mm. uh, novel, so it's oh. kind of based on a real uh, journey that happened. But it's it's also got some fantasy elements, so they end up getting stalked by a monster, which sounds great. And it obviously it happens in the Arctic circle. Yeah, in the Arctic. So it's very frost punky horror, I guess. Yeah. That's, which is relevant to you, Crystal, even you've done <laughs> frost punk themed horror. Yup. Um, um, I've been watching two sentence horror movie or two sentence sentence horror stories, which is on Netflix. Okay. Um, and it is it is fantastic. Um, so what they do is they take like a normal start of a sentence, like the first sentence is always like a normal like a cliche or something like that, and then they twist it. So, um, oh, hold on, right. let me see if I can. Uh, yeah. And so like the first one was my sister wants to talk. She's been so angry since she died. <laughs> so like it's, and it's so fantastic. Um, and it has an amazing cast and it has, um, uh, like really good special effects and there aren't a lot of special effects. Oh. So the ones that they do have are really good. It reminds me of um, an expansion for Change from the Lost, which is called Proverbial Horrors. Was it Change? It's either it's Chronicles of Darkness, definitely called Proverbial Horrors, which is like you know where there's a saying, but actually it could be some horror creature. So, which again kind of gets us almost, I guess, kind of does get us to the topic because proverbs and and nursery rhymes can also have kind of creepy elements to them yeah. for children. What are we talking yeah. about, Sam? Uh, well, uh, because everybody's kind of having a lot of anxiety at the moment, you know, whether that's to do with COVID still or anything else, um, I thought the best thing to do would be to retreat into our childhood fears instead, um, because we'll be safe in the knowledge that juvenile nightmares are largely irrational, unlike the very real and immediate horrors that we face as adults. Hmm. Uh, personally though I now have a better understanding of my own mental health it's difficult to make peace with Um, I definitely suffered anxiety when I was young but you can more easily wish it away because it manifests as say like a boogeyman or things like that Um, eventually you won't believe in it anymore and you kind of grow out of it so it's not quite as simple to dismiss a chemical imbalance in the brain but if we're talking about monsters you can just say that's not real Hmm. and then ignore it Um, So I guess we're going to talk about things that plagued us in the dark when we were children and reminisce about disturbing media that punctuated our youth. Uh, So do you guys want me to start? I think it sounds like a fun topic. Okay, sure. Um, Yeah, probably the first thing that I can remember is that I attended ballet lessons between the ages of two and seven. And the class took place in the local Methodist church. Um, Sounds creepy already, right? (laughs) It was a modern building, but they had this closet in the hallway. 
And inside the closet was a full size, I believe to be plastic, but I'm not sure, medical skeleton, right? Hmm. Now that I think back, I think it may have been a real one. It was very old, like an antique. Um, I don't know why it was in there. The church also held a play group some days and some other things, but we used to dare each other to open the closet and look at the skeleton. I found it deeply terrifying and I hated to think about it just standing there in the dark, you know, just knowing that it was there. Um, if you weren't careful, it would fall out onto you as you open the closet. Um, our dance teachers would scold everybody for being silly and screaming whenever we walk past the closet. Hmm. So uh, that's probably one of the first ones for me. Um, another thing in Manchester Arndale Centre, which uh, is still the big shopping mall where I grew up, uh, they used to have a life-size Dalek. Uh, he was, you know, robotic. So he would move around and shout exterminate really loudly. I was about four at the time. And I had literally no idea what a Dalek was, who Doctor Who was or anything. I'd never seen it. But I was petrified by this Dalek without context. So you'd have other kids being taken towards it and geeking out over it. I was crying and my mother could not walk me past it at all. Hmm. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So... I also had insomnia from a very young age. Uh, I never slept my whole life, basically. Uh, I don't know where I first heard about Dracula because vampires weren't a huge part of pop culture when I was born. So you had like Dracula and you had the Count from Sesame Street. That was about it. Maybe Count Ducula as well. Oh, Count Ducula. <laughs> um, I must have come across Bella Lugosi somehow because I had a phase of nightmares about Dracula. So I didn't really understand what he did or what he was. I just thought he'd come and get me. Um, I would lie awake every night and hide under my covers so he wouldn't see me. I must have gotten over it at some point because there's a photo of me with vampire face paint when I was seven. Um, you want me to continue with stories or would you like to interject? I think what, well, yeah, um, oh, so yeah, Crystal, yeah, any similar things? <laughs> okay, so I have been since, since we've just started discussing this, I have been racking my brain because I remember as a child being scared of certain things, but not to the point of like memories or continued terror, like I. Um, I know my sister was like terrified of the movie it and anything to do with it or child's play. Um, but I never felt like those type of fears. I do remember. And I still kind of have this today where I don't like dark basements. Um, I get, I get creeped out and I start feeling like, um, adrenaline and stuff like that, like pumping through me <laughs> whenever I'm in them. And, um, unlike, my childhood, I was not afraid of spiders as a child, but I had a content warning. I had an experience with a spider when I was in high school um, that uh, caused me to have this terror of spiders. So I have a fear of spiders now that I didn't have when I was younger. And mm. I try, I've been trying so hard to figure out something like that I was actually terrified of. And I can only think of one thing, and that was the feeling of being scared. Hmm. that yeah. like the the concept of it and the feeling of it was actually what I was afraid of it was that like fear of anxiety yeah I so, relate to that a lot because I I have anxiety myself so that's actually my fear now is the fear of being afraid yeah like because like I, I remember being I I went to a Catholic school uh, a Catholic elementary school and after school, we would go to the church basement where we would have like after school care until our parents were able to pick us up. And I remember playing things like Bloody Mary um, as like a third grader in the in the, the bathroom of this place. And I remember being scared, but not of Bloody Mary, like thinking Bloody Mary was going to come, but more of like the anxiety of what might happen. Yeah, because it kind of gives you an adrenaline rush. Yeah, and I think that it's the adrenaline rush that actually terrifies me more than the actual concept of something. Mm. Yeah, we, we so, started yeah, I was, uh, doing... like trying to wrap my brain around that. Yeah, we started Sorry. Um, doing, you know, Bloody Mary, White Lady stuff, Candyman, uh, when I was about 10. Um, and that was in the, the school bathroom. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if any of us believed that it would happen, but it was it was more like, you know 
we turn the lights out and we'd all do it and then someone inevitably would go like bah! like mm. you know or, or the boys would hear us do it outside the girls bathroom and they would knock on the door and we'd all scream and stuff so kind of like uh, a little ritual like you know everyone was kind of having fun everyone was sort of in on the joke if you know what i mean yeah yeah hmm. my childhood fears I think are rooted initially in a the house I grew up in was quite is you know is old because it's like what Georgian no no it's Edwardian isn't it um it's Victorian it's Victorian Edwardian late yeah. Victorian yeah so it had some bits of upkeep that need to be done so it wasn't great and if it was a particularly windy night it would mean the the, the hatch to the attic would have been slid away which is really disconcerting when that's literally you have to literally go past that to get to your bedroom that wasn't the wind chris yeah (laughs) um that was a demon equally the basement was again also quite creepy dark and old and had things from previous generations there and I think it was literally like the the basement area under the living room was like, I guess the walls were kind of pitch black because it used to be where they would have had all the coal. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. that wasn't great. Um, I would say I definitely had a fear because of, of the hatch thing. That made me creep out. And I think mostly because of other things like film. Like I, I clearly, I distinctly remember being far too young, mostly having gone downstairs and caught the face hugger section uh, out of Alien. And that obviously... Oh burned itself into my brain and so uh that's why then i guess i had a fear of aliens not aliens well aliens and alien in a kind of in a in a way and i think that's you know, alien abductions kind of like creepy. i i was scared of aliens um like little green men in yeah. the sense of um i was actually scared of et when i was very young <laughs> Um, I just went through this phase. It must have been only for like a month. And it was just very strange. Like, but but I love E.T. now. I just, you know, I think I enjoyed it when I first saw it. And then I started to kind of overthink it. I just thought it was quite frightening. Um, Yeah. But yeah, I feel, I feel kind of the odd one out now because I, I have some very specific fears that I remember. Um, I'm trying to think of other specific things. Um, not really. Um, I think that's about it. Maybe you just blanked them out because they were that terrifying. Well, th- but that leads <laughs> you, but that's a really good point about blanking it out because I think there's childhood fears have two com- there's two components to our memory of childhood fears so i think that's why as like adults trying to remember them it creeps you out a is because you partially remember stuff and that's you partially remember how you felt about it and that's you trying to process it and then you remember how you felt thinking about it and that creeps you out but then also it's that kind of very primal fear of someone's going to take you away from your parents or mm. or something like that uh and that's why then that relates to like kind of scar folk and that kind of 70s kind of like oh that was creepy yeah on I'll, tv i'll, I'll because, talk about that a bit yeah because it's like yeah. again because you you don't have a record but you knew you saw it because they didn't record tv in the same way back then mm. yeah well mm. so when you when you said that you accidentally saw alien yeah um how old were you right so alien came out in 1979 I was born in 1983. Now, consider this as the 80s and how long it would have taken films to get onto, like, you know, mainstream television on a, on a major TV channel in the British Isles back then, when there was likely, what, four channels? Maybe they'd only just become four channels. It'll have to be, like, 1980. Oh, it's going to be 87, 88, I imagine. That's yeah. pretty bad. It's bad when you consider the imagery... And symbolism in alien face huggers, face hugger eggs. It's all just like, oh no. Yeah, it's it's interesting because um I never saw movies like that as a child because my mum hates horror movies and you know she wouldn't have anything of that sort in the house. You know, she's not like religious or anything, she's just really easily scared. 
um, which I find funny nowadays because you'll watch a lot of these Scandi murder shows where there's like incest and paedophilia and all sorts of horrible things. Made and up then, horror versus yeah. something that can be very, very bloody real. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, she never sort of entertained that kind of thing. So if I was, you know, exposed to these other things, then it would have been through my friends. You know, I, di- I didn't go around to people's houses and watch certain things. Uh, but one interesting one is actually Jurassic Park, which now I do actually love. Uh, but when it came out, I was quite afraid of it, um, even though I didn't see it in the cinema. So um, at school, at primary school, we had swimming lessons once a week and we had to get a coach from the school to the swimming baths. Uh, the journey took half an hour. So I'd sit with my best friend and we'd talk about stuff we'd done at the weekend. So we're about, you know, seven at the time. Um, one time she'd been to see Jurassic Park at the cinema. Uh, it sounded a bit scary to me. Uh, my mother would not have taken me to see it. Uh, so my friend explained the movie in minute detail, half on the way to the swimming baths and half on the way back. Um, so her description of the raptors in the kitchen really stuck in my imagination. And a year or so later, she actually got the VHS and we watched the film at her house. I had to go home before the end. So she gave me the video to borrow. I watched the kitchen scene alone by myself at home. And I was sat on the floor absolutely paralyzed with fear. I later had really vivid dreams about raptors for years, honestly. I was a teenager by the time I actually enjoyed Jurassic Park. So I'm a huge fan now. But I, I had really vivid dreams about, you know, ra- raptors uh, pouncing on me and, like, biting me. And, mm. yeah, mauling me um. to death. Yeah. I, so my mom actually had the same thing where, like, she didn't really care for horror movies um, unless they were, like, real-life murder mystery type of things. Like, for some reason, you know, have any, any little fantasy or supernatural, and nope, she doesn't want anything to do with it, but... If it's based on a true story, she's all over it. Hmm. And even like even growing up, that was a thing. And I think like I keep thinking back because my sister and I both absolutely love horror movies now. And when we were growing up, we didn't. And I'm like, I'm almost like, was it because my mom kept saying that she didn't like it? So we just kind of took on that mentality of, oh, well, we probably won't like it either. (laughs) So like this, this whole thing like has me guessing and trying to figure out like what was my childhood you know (laughs) yeah Yeah, like for me it was definitely like that my mum um it's not like she would ban these things but because she wasn't interested I thought oh mum says that would be really scary so I probably won't watch it and you know because I had insomnia anyway it's you know I didn't want anything that would stop me going to sleep so um it was kind of this fear of the unknown which is probably why you know I was such a scaredy cat when I was a child because it was this mystery and if I had actually been allowed to read some things or watch some things I might not have been quite as afraid although I do think I was quite young for a lot of things I blame my sister she she rent <laughs> she she got my parents to rent horror movies and she's four years older than me so she's to blame for those <laughs> things I turned out as a as a fine well-rounded individual <laughs> did, did your parents I, them with you uh, yes did they most okay. of them yeah if not all of them yes <laughs> um distinctly because so, even so even even, even because ignorance. even because my mother would joke about one in particular called demonic toys which is <gasps> Both equally creepy, but at the same time, it's just fucking ridiculous. And so it's actually kind of it's it's borderline cartoonish in its horror because it has it has one thing though, which is kind of terrifying, which is a demonic Jack in the Box, which is just like. Ugh. Well, for me, like in in the H and V in Manchester, in the flagship store, um, in the nineties and two thousands, they used to have a horror section, and it was all videos. So they had this incredible artwork, you know, that you'd have on 80s and 90s videos for horror. Um, By the time I was about 10, I was reading the back of each one. So Mm -hmm. I was reading all the blurbs and freaking myself out uh, with every synopsis. So the ones that really stick with me are Child's Play and The Dentist, for some reason. It had this, this really, like, frightening artwork, like very graphic artwork on the front. Um, my mother did not know why I knew about all these awful films, <laughs> you know, like where I was getting it from. 
um, it's just because I used to spend an hour in HMV looking at them. So I didn't start watching proper horror movies until my mid-teens. Uh, before that, it was just classics. Um, you know, I was staying over at my father's flat one night. I woke up after watching videos that were not horror movies. Um, he was asleep. My brother was asleep. And Hammer Studios' Twins of Evil was on TV, which didn't scare me at all. Uh, so that was the first time I'd seen Peter Cushing in anything. Everything about it was completely fascinating to me. That's when I started being interested in Halloween, watching episodes of Eerie Indiana, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Mm. Things like that. So more age-appropriate horror. Age-appropriate horror. <laughs> I um... not, I was going to say not, not, not age-appropriate kids shows, which, when you look at it, are horrific. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> Because we'll um, get on to that, yeah. So, so my mom didn't like outright like ban horror horror at all or anything like that either. She just didn't care. Like on family movie nights, she's like, ah, I'm not interested in watching that. So we just wouldn't get it. But my parents had no problem with me reading horror stories. Hmm. And so I grew up like I remember very distinctly in like early middle school reading scary stories to tell in the dark hmm. which if you are if you're at all familiar with that that um uh book series is is not kid friendly horror no it, it's actually pretty terrifying horror and the art on there is extremely graphic um it's still one of my favorite book series as an adult um but it you know like that and goosebumps which is also kind of appropriate but not at the same time if you actually look at like some of the goosebumps stories you're like no that's actually really terrifying yeah um i'm gonna talk about um goosebumps so yeah like my mom actually. had no problem yeah. with me reading those. nice <laughs> but like uh scary stories to tell in the dark so um i actually had to look this up when the recent movie came out because we didn't have those books here at all like solely an american thing we had goosebumps and stuff but we didn't have scary, you know, I would not have been able to cope with that. Um, I would say maybe middle nine to Same. Two, Yeah, for real. Wow. So yeah, yeah. Uh, with Goosebumps. Um, so I desperately wanted to read the Goosebumps books. I was always a bookworm, but my um, she was right, obviously. I finally got hold of two Goosebumps books. Uh, and he'd, uh, you know, he'd read and stuff. So, you know, you know, they had that kind of 3D yep. effect on it with the bubbles and everything. Yeah. So I could not stop thinking about it. I gave the few, like... I don't know, like, I didn't read Goosebumps or anything like that. I think I was just too primed on, like, a horror movies at too early an age. And then... and. Uh... Uh, and then that was around about the time when Channel 4 had their anime season. So I watched uh, like I would be so uh, MacGyver, which is again, it's just like ridiculous, like bio horror. So there's a theme coming on here. Look, bio horror, bio horror and alien when you're far too young. Mm, bio horror. Um, so that might explain my like, I think what I find most horrific. And this is coming from a guy that that collects kingdom death, for Christ's sake. So um, let's let's put that into context. Um yeah, but actual scary things on like TV shows, like other things. Um, Tales of the Unexpected intro sequence is terrifying when you're I about don't know five. If I've ever seen that. Oh, oh, oh boy! It's really great. It's well, they're written by Roald Dahl, who a great is a, star is a problem, but they're amazing. Yeah. It's, huh. it's like, basically, the intro sequence has this kind of music that sounds like a carousel, almost. It's kind of got that kind of up and that kind of cyclic kind of ennui kind of feeling to it. But then it's got all the imagery is of, like, death and luck and chance. So you've got, like, skulls with flames behind the Shadows. eyes. Shadows pistols and cards and then you've also got this like um silhouette of this dancing woman and this was shown around uh, around about like what two three o'clock in the afternoon on like daytime tv huh. and you're just like what the hell are they showing this on like <laughs> it was just bizarre and it just kind of gets in your head and it's it's little things like that because that's the same thing like why certain tv adverts are terrifying when you go back to looking at stuff on british tv like put a grid on it is the classic or or oh or, or the spirit of dark water is yeah, the, the I, renowned yeah. one 
Um, I, th I think I find those more scary, but I think that's because they're more primal in their nature. They, when, when I was getting into my teenage years, you know, you move on from, say, Goosebumps books to reading Point Horror, which were a bit more grown up, mm -hmm. you know, and had like romance elements in them sometimes and things like that. They had really good art on the front as well. Um, I was reading, you know, more classic horror things when I was a teenager. So I read The Doll's House by M.R. James. Mm. And that made me absolutely certain that my Doll's House dolls were living a secret life when I tried to sleep. <laughs> I was terrified that I would see things moved around inside the house or the light switched on when I hadn't touched it. So I've had this like love-hate relationship with dolls that's been like pervasive throughout my life. I like them, but I don't trust them. Mm. So um, I'd go through phases when I wasn't bothered, but then I'd hear or read something which scared me all over again. So a school friend told me the plot to the film Dolly Dearest. Okay. Um, so I tried to work out which one of my dolls would try and kill me first. So Dolly Dearest, Dearest is like, um, uh, it's uh, as I remember, it's a guy who runs a doll factory and he gives one of the dolls to his daughter. But the doll's like defective, it's like, you know, possessed or whatever. And it kills the babysitter and yeah. stuffs her into a freezer, things like that. It's quite an old movie. Um, yeah, I also read teen magazines, like in the UK, Shout magazine, which often included spooky real life stories. Now, this is just a thing that you need to know about, like teenage girls and things like ghosts and witchcraft and things, you know, that's 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 just how it is. You know, if you're a teenage girl and you're reading things, it's like, oh, do this spell at the sleepover to find out your true love's name and all this kind of mystical shit. So that that's just how it is sometimes. Clearly, clearly, um, clearly teen teen girl magazines are the work of the Illuminati. Though. Yeah, honestly. Anyway. Written by lizards, <laughs> are they? So sometimes you get a whole book of these real life stories as a freebie, usually for the Halloween special of the Ooh. magazine which encourage reading the stories to each other at your sleepover. A lot of them featured dolls. So I remember also quite a specific issue on the problem pages in a normal issue of Shout Magazine. And a girl had written saying a friend had told her about killer dolls with three fingers who murder you in the dark. <laughs> and she was having oh. trouble sleeping because of it. Of course, the agony aunt responded that this was not a rational fear. <laughs> and I was just here thinking, wait, killer dolls with three fingers? I have to worry about this now? That's the fae. It's the fae. So, you know... Yeah, that's totally the fae. Wh whether they they should have published that, I don't know, because it, it made people like me think about this. But it's like, I was just blissfully going along with my life, not thinking about killer dolls with three fingers, and then they put it into my head. I've I've got a question because obviously other like memories of like you know fears of like one particular I, I don't know why I now think of this it's like you know the whole oh alien abduction I remember one nightmare being like being driven back from my grandparents which who live out in the middle of no re in the relative middle of nowhere as middle of nowhere can be in the UK and so how do you think i think crystal this is a good question to you actually do you do you feel like where you grew up and like possibly how rural or in the sticks it was or not influenced kind of like kind of childhood fears or phobias or um i'm going to say yes or no i think it kind of fed more of the fear of anxiety cuz so in Wisconsin, um, the northern part of Wisconsin is mostly woodland and my family has property up there. So every single summer we would spend the summer, almost the entire summer up there with my grandparents who were retired at the time. And there are things like a bear that come wandering right up to your patio door and look into the window and packs of wolves that howl at night that if you're not careful, will eat your dog. And um, that's also um, the like the area of Wisconsin where like the hodag has been spotted, which is a cryptid in Wisconsin. Um, there's also tales, um, and I've heard this way before I even knew the name of it was the Wendigo, where if you ever hear someone screaming in the woods, do not go looking for them unless they are calling or unless you're with a group of people. So like... Stuff like that, I think, kind of more fed the anxiety that I'm that I felt for the fear because knowing this stuff happens and like being around it, you're kind of like, okay, 
I know how to deal with this. You know, is that a bear or is it something else that I have to worry about? And you kind of start checking off in your head what it is. So I don't think it really fed into anything. I think more like made my brain process things logically in like a checklist order of, okay, is it this? Nope. Is it this? Nope. Is it this? Nope. Oh, it might be this, you know? (laughs) Well, I think as, you know, being from the UK, um, the, you know, the wilderness uh, that you have in the U S is really different to the quote unquote wilderness that you have in the UK, because there are less places where you're really not near any civilization. You'd have to be like in you know, Scotland. You, yeah, you'd have to be somewhere in Scotland. Or Wales. Um, and even then, it's not as big. The you know the expanse of wilderness is just crazy in the US, and you have the you know the mountains and the woodland and all sorts of things. And then you know we don't really have the the same wildlife that you do. So it's really funny that you know you talk about scary noises in the wilderness. And then the non-scary answer is that it's a bear. <laughs> because to us, that would be a very scary answer. Or, oh, it's just a pack of wolves. Yeah. Because we don't have those anymore in the UK. No. So, I, I um, will say yeah. that, yeah, like one of the things, so coyotes, the sound of them do scare me. And that's because I heard them and seen them take down an entire deer. Um, so like actual living things, I am scared of. Coyotes are terrifying when they're hungry. Uh, wolves would be the same thing for me. They are terrifying if they are hungry. They'll come around people. Um, so yeah, but like if I if I know what I'm dealing with, I'm like, okay, well, they don't like loud noises or like you know, bear. Depending on what color it is, well, you can climb a tree or you're going to play dead. One of the two. Like <laughs> so, and um, in northern Wisconsin, like where where my family goes up to. There are no city lights. The closest city is about an hour away. And so you see like on a on a dark night if there is no full moon, it is dark. So it is really hard to see at night. So you learn pretty quickly to try and distinguish sound. It's pretty much go down to Logston. There's actually people that live within about 10 minutes walk. Yeah. Like <laughs> Um, what's really interesting is that you know you know obviously it like in wisconsin if there if there was something you know more supernatural or demonic out there and you heard a noise you wouldn't go out anyway because you think it was a bear or some coyotes whereas here maybe it's more dangerous because we can hear creepy noises sometimes that are like foxes mating or something or you know a fox in heat you Mm. know vixen in heat which is this horrible screeching noise and it's really demonic and scary and but you just think oh it's nothing it's just a fox out there and you'd go out anyway and you'd put yourself in danger because you'd be like nothing out there can hurt me is that why is that possibly why you know british you've got folk horror but then also you've got urban weird which is like kind of like because folk horror is about like the fear of exposure really you know like you're out in the countryside and you've got nowhere to go and it's all it's around you the the wilderness but urban weird's like the fear of exposure like in urban spaces and i think that's one of the creepy things is like where where you do get that kind of overlap because we're not it's i think it's interesting where you can be programmed one way or, or another like oh it's the wilderness i know what's going on it's either this 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 or this and either all of those are are things to tackle but they can be tackled and if you live in a city, it's either this, 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 or this. They're all bad because it's either crime, crime, another crime, or drunkards. If it's like the the like in between, you can't. I don't think. I don't think. Our, I think our lizard brains, depending upon where we've been brought up, have trouble like working out what it is, which leads you to make stupid, stupid decisions. Like, yep. oh, what's that scream? Either it's a person or it's a fox. That, it feels there's a disc there's a dissonance well yeah because if you've got like suburban horror yeah also in places in the u.s where you would not get bears or anything they'd be like well that's not a bear because you wouldn't get a bear here yeah mm. but it could be someone in danger but would that also put me in danger you know i i would have to say if i were to go wandering out in the wilderness out by you i would probably die from something because <laughs> i'd be like <laughs> I don't know what that sound is. I'm going to go investigate because I know what all the sounds are in my house, you know, in my area. So I should know what this sound is too. And this isn't a sound I'm used to. 
<laughs> oh, it was really weird when we were living in Germany because there was like this. Um, because where we were living it, with Bochum, it was you know, obviously urban, but there were like just really deep patches of like woods and oh, stuff. Yeah. And walking through this path, which was basically a whole big chunk of like just, just a bit of a chunk of trees, but it was so dark, just trying to get to the shops. And you're just like, why am I scared going through here? And it just felt like a, a route through a dark little grove. It was well, weird. Well, I think we were scared because here in the UK, there's a lot more person on person crime and mm. people would mug you. Whereas in Germany, at least in that area, you wouldn't really get that. So again, it's like we've been programmed to interpret yeah, things. Yeah, because I was like, how could people not be, be afraid? I guess that's that gets to the point of childhood fears and stuff is about what your lizard brain is programmed to interpret and then also what you get primed to interpret based upon like the media you're exposed to, um, like the uh, like the spirit of dark water. Yeah, um I love him. He's he's a, he's he's a hero of mine. He inspires all my writing. Yeah, because these, I know. you know, yeah, we talk about this oh. a lot. <laughs> um yeah, they sent think... me some of the videos of it and I was like I'm watching I'm like this is just weird. Like for for Americans, oh. we didn't have anything like that at all. A weird puppet show. So the 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 classics that I would say are creepy are like what is it? It's um the Riddlers. Yeah. They're just these really ugly, almost goblinoid kind of like uh puppets that are in this faux kind of they're meant to be in like a Victorian kind of setting doing everyday stuff with a bit of fey magic mixed in. And oh yeah, that's just, again, one of them's wearing a little waistcoat. It's all it? just warning signs to me. <laughs> and then um, the other one is um, uh, Pipkin, which had... Oh, what's the name of the... Ra- yeah, but the surely of- you don't remember Pipkin. You're no, I, I watched, you, well, I watched seen, reruns. That's we've different. seen reruns of things that, that first ran in the 70s, but yeah. then they didn't have anything else to show in the 90s. So we were watching stuff that our parents were afraid of. Or sometimes our parents would go, oh, that's lovely, lovely, lovely Pipkin. And we're like, ah! This, this <laughs> mangy rabbit bloody puppet yes. is, that has this... Yes, what's going on? You're like, that is not a friendly voice. That's the voice of 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 a fey terror. Um You said nosy bonk, didn't you? Nosy bonk is like one that I never experienced, but like we can thank oh Howard for that one. Like what the fuck is that about? Yeah, that one's just weird. So that's, that, that's mimes and masks being oh scary. God. Yeah. And did you guys um... ever did you guys ever play like Ghost in the Graveyard growing up? Um, what's that? Okay. I was not <laughs> sure if it was a universal thing or not. Okay, so, and this probably is why, like, oh, uh, why, like, if I'm in a dark basement, I, I'm i scared. But if I'm outside in the dark, I'm not scared. And that's because, I like, when I grew up, we played Ghosts in the Graveyard up, up in northern Wisconsin, where it was a pitch black at night where you couldn't see. And basically what it is is that one kid would close their eyes and count to 12 and there's like a rhythm that you do because you're counting down the clock and at midnight you shout out midnight hope to see a ghost tonight and you um the one kid goes out and hides and then everyone else goes to try to find the ghost and when you find the ghost you shout ghost in the graveyard and the ghost is supposed to go tag somebody and then they're the next person to go hide right that sounds like tempting fate to me (laughs) (laughs) um yeah oh wow so yeah we Uh, used to play that like we used to play that all the time every every single night over the summer um growing up until like i even played it in high school i remember playing yeah that's that's a that's a creepy one well i think a lot of the you know british like games that you playground games were inherently creepy they'd have rhymes to them or you'd had like blind man's buff which was quite weird yeah just just normal ones really mm. and then other things you'd have which were clearly you know very pagan like you know maypole dancing all that sort of thing this actually brings up an interesting point like obviously how much these things handed down through the generations like you know it's again it's like programming you to kind of like be aware or, or like you know it is awareness of things and i think that's always been in like especially like with certain rhyme nursery rhymes and so forth 
But like, do we like what's going on with kids now? Because like, is I media have... less scary for kids? Uh, it's like so. When I the say students. That, it, yeah, go on. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you go, go on. You about to say something interesting. So the students that I'm teaching currently are in middle school, and they a lot of them are playing Ghosts in the Graveyard, and a lot of them are still reading Goosebumps. Um, I have one of them that's reading Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, and I did not tell them to do that. I'm fairly certain it was their mm. parents that did. Um, wow. <laughs> so, like, a lot of them are not actually underexposed to a lot of the media like that we were exposed to they're doing the same things um yeah. but i'm wondering if maybe because of the awareness of mental health and like support and trying to process and helping coach kids through processing feelings that they're actually coping with it better than we did yeah and that's that's interesting so they're still picking up like the <laughs> what would now be considered the classics <laughs> So, you know, it's, I guess what I'm getting at is like, is it more modern media like that's been made after our generation with kids that are now, there's less of that content in there due to whatever, I don't know, because I don't feel Disney films are the same as when they actually like, you know, oh yeah, get down and dirty with it right at the end. And by that, I mean, like really face the terror and do something. It's. Yeah, I was thinking about that actually with um, Snow White was one thing that scared me quite a bit um, because, you know, so you know the, the witch when there's the, the transformation scene mm. when she turns into the old hag. Mm. Like that's really psychedelic and like trippy and strange. And that was like quite groundbreaking for the time. And also, you know, sort of her death at the end, you know, because you don't really see it because, you know, she falls off the cliff. But the the vultures who've been Mm. watching her, they circle and then they go after her. And I just couldn't stop thinking about that. Quite scared of vultures, actually. Yeah, you wouldn't. I don't think you'd get that in a modern Disney film. Well, yeah, I mean, um, it's interesting because in most Disney films, even back then, you would have the villain fall to their death by accident that's to that's to absolve the hero or whatever mm. of killing somebody um yep the there's a rule for disney where the any yeah. death occur off scene and the hero can't be the one that deals it i think the only one that i know of is in sleeping beauty because he does actually stab the dragon but that's because she's a dragon at that moment. She is a dragon. Yeah, she's not a person. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Um. Yeah, so I'm trying to think of some of the other media that I was going to talk about. Um. I was going to talk about, Um. you know, when you're talking about puppets, I was going to mention Rosie and Jim. This, <laughs> this, this is a British show. And they're, they're just, they're a pair of puppets that live on a canal boat and go on little adventures. And um, which sounds really nice. But I read this like hilarious synopsis in an article and I can't remember what it said now, but it was just really angry about how creepy it was. Like, why? Why would you do this? It's like, um, it's like, it's along the same lines of like what Howard wrote about Bagpuss. It's like Bagpuss, the way he, the way that, sorry, the way that Howard wrote it, um, Howard wrote that Bagpuss was essentially like an old god being woken up by offerings by this child. And it was just like, it's nuts. But it's beautiful in its interpretation of Bagpuss um, as almost an eldritch it. creature. <laughs> it's so it was so crazy to read, but brilliant. Um, oh, um, oh, yes, yes, yes. So I just looked at Sam's Sam's notes, and all of these are up there. Yeah, well, I know you hate Five Children and It. I f- fucking hate the because the, the one that was sand on, fairy. Yeah, the the sand the sand fairy is really scary. So we're talking about the BBC series from yeah. like way back when, like over twenty years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, compared oh. to the new CGI one, which is Four Children, which is technically a sequel because it's written by the same person anyway. Um, it's, it's a sequel. It is a sequel. It's written by Jacqueline Wilson. <laughs> yeah, and it's a sequel. Yeah, but it's not written by the same person. Is it not? Oh, well, no, either way. It's a really old book. Okay, well, either way, I hate the Sand Fairy. It's just, again, a very ugly, bay like creature. It's a goblin. It looked like it was, ba- the way it, it granted wishes looked like it was passing wind at the same time. Everything was just wrong. Um, but the next one on the list is pretty great. Well, I was going to say The Ink Thief because it's really, really weird. It's um, genuinely strange, bizarre ITV children's series. 
Um, it's from 1994, and it has Richard O'Brien as a villain mm. who steals the power of imagination by sucking the ink out of books. Um, I remember that one. Yes, it also has a bunch of strange goblin puppet creatures in it, and it has songs, so it's musical as well. Oh, now I'm beginning to remember it. I have but to look up some Toya video Wilcox of it. Is in it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, well, Richard O'Brien's got the same energy as um, the guy from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, the child snatcher. Yeah. Which leads you to the, which immediately leads you down to another British TV, uh, British advert, which is the Judder Man, which, sca- which is renowned, renowned for scaring the pants off kids. Back I then. think we've spoken about this on Darker Days Radio before. Yeah, the Judder Man's classic. Look him up. Yeah. I model myself on him. <laughs> um. <laughs> I am so, going to have to look him up. Yeah. Um. So Tales from the Crypt. You know the the series. Like, so, oh, I love the, that series. <laughs> the Crypt Keeper scared the shit out of me. <laughs> like, I don't know why. Uh, yeah. You know, I know he's really funny and everything. Oh, he's but, a classic. But, um, I was going to talk about the bit in Willow where they get turned into pigs. I can't watch that movie. <laughs> it's horrible. It is. It's it is deep awful. Body horror. It's terrifying. It's again. I think it's that's related to. I'm sure there's some other other films that kind of attach on it. But again, it's the idea of kids. I think also why kids find it scary is like being changed from being recognizable as you are to your parents is a is profoundly horrifying. Yeah, I would have to agree. (laughs) It's just like that removal of your identity, I think. Especially when you're forming your identity. Like I think right now as adults, you'd be like, oh, I can be I could be someone else isn't so terrifying as a kid like we can change you from you wouldn't even be you yeah but pig men are also terrifying i find i don't know why pig men are terrifying i think it's because it's because pigs eat everything and you only have to take that and then anthropomorphize it and then you're into a whole like world of just like no but then that also anthropomorphism scary because we watched the new um witches yeah i was gonna say about that about <laughs> getting turned into oh, a I haven't seen that one yet. Um, it's it's good. It's it's a bit thin on the storyline side. That you know, it's interesting because I thought they would have added more elements from the book, and they actually took them away, and it was quite short and yeah, you know, narrowed down a little bit. So I found that a bit disappointing. Um, it's interesting because you know some of the direction that they did with with you know how the witches looked and stuff. Like I thought it was scary but not necessarily scarier than the original movie Mm. or your imagination when you read the book because I read the book in primary school and you know it did actually make you kind of worry about perfectly nice women and you know in a way that a misogynistic kind of way that Roald Dahl intended for you to to worry about perfectly nice women who were wearing gloves uh, which was really quite unusual to wear gloves. So if you did see a, a, a woman wearing gloves in the 90s... He wasn't coding for anything, was he? Um, yes, he definitely was. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, like, I remember that sort of making me a little bit paranoid when I was young. And one of the things I think was really missing from the new film is, you know, um, it's different because they, they change, you know, you know where some of it's set. So I think it's um, Alabama mm. where, you know, it starts in and things like that. Um, they do mention some connections to Norway and yeah. as well as where the witches come from. But um, uh, one of the main things that's really frightening in the book, and I actually had a discussion about this recently with some fellow goths on Instagram, uh, because someone, I, I think they had put up a picture of a painting that for some reason reminded everybody of this painting that's featured in the book, The Witches. And um, everyone was like, oh, um, uh, I think uh, the little girl's name is uh, Solvig or Solvig. And and everyone was just saying, you're yeah, Solvig, the little girl. Oh, so no. th- th- this is, um, it's like, a, I think that it's meant to be an oil painting of a farmhouse and there's a river and things, there's ducks. And what the witch did to this little girl uh, was magic her to be in the painting forever. So she was stuck in the painting forever. And the horrifying thing about it was that 
she would age within the painting so you saw her become like a young woman and then an old woman and then eventually she just disappeared from the painting uh. so she spent her whole life stuck in this painting because she'd eaten like a, a poisoned apple or something right. and i thought that was so frightening that you know i thought about that a lot so i was disappointed that that was missing but yeah the the whole transformation aspect with you know turning into mice and things i thought that was like pretty scary and the, in the original film in the in the film original version of the film they had the witch's transformation was a lot more human ratish oh yeah process which is also i mean again go with the anthropomorphic thing there are other anthropomorphic elements which if you see as kids i a deeply just like eesh, like skexies nah oh i hate them they can get in the bin <laughs> i mean i like them but i hate them um and uh is it company of wolves yeah yeah that's that's a disturbing. That's actually my favourite werewolf transformation there is. It's a very good one when it through the mouth. Yeah, yeah that's wrong. That's just wrong on so many levels. Um, well, I also with Dark Crystal. I was very afraid of it as a child, and it still kind of gives me an uneasy feeling. Mm. Um, so I haven't watched the new one because. I know I'll be quite afraid. So, um, yeah, I just, there was something really that, that kind of hit me really hard with it, you know, because, um, sorry, Kira, she gets, she gets stabbed. Yeah. With the light crystal at the end. And it's just like, it's just horrible. Like it's, it's, you know, it's just some of these children's movies giving you these really deep emotions, like when you're almost too young to process it. So one of the ones I always talk about is uh, The Never Ending Story, which is one of my favorite movies. But I don't yep. like to to watch the scene where Artax drowns uh, because it's just there's something. The music is very emotive, and I I can't listen to that music at all. It's like it's like somebody bottled the feeling of depression, you no, know, and it's just how it feels, and it it's very traumatic to listen to. And it's you know the swamps of sadness sequence is they have just encapsulated what depression and you know hopelessness feels like. And I think to be exposed to that when you're that young is just really devastating. You know, it's not just the horse died, you know, that the, the horse could have been, you know, shot with an arrow or something. And it, it's the way the horse dies. And it's it's just that, you know, when you're thinking, oh, you can get him out, you know, pull him out. And the horse just doesn't want to. And it's just, as an adult, it's too relatable with the feeling of depression. And it's just horrible. Mm. I don't think Chris knows what I mean. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, um, no, no. Maybe when I was finishing up my thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. I so that scene, like looking back and watching that movie as an adult, that scene definitely hits way different than when I was a child because I never felt that like I didn't actually process what was actually happening to him until I was an adult. Um, and I don't know why. I don't know why I didn't connect the two, but the scene definitely like it didn't set off that that fear or terror for me. I was just like, oh, he's losing his horse. That's really sad, but not the reason why. Yeah, because I think as a kid, you maybe even kind of sympathize more with Atreyu. Yeah. And you're like, oh, you know, and he's like, stupid horse. Why? And you're like, yeah, stupid horse. Why aren't you getting out? Mm. You know, and you don't understand. But as an adult, you do understand why. Yeah. So I mean, it's yeah, okay. like it's okay at the I, I, end because he he's alive at the end. You see him yeah. at the end, but it, it doesn't change how bad it felt. Yeah, that definitely definitely does not change the the feeling. Looking back at like as an adult, that that scene definitely hits a little differently. Um, I'm trying the uh, what is it? Um, uh, Watershed Deep is another one. Watership Down or Watership Down? There we go. <laughs> Rabbits. That's something. Rabbits, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, that's another one that, like, when I was a child, I didn't process exactly what was happening, and then I watched it as an adult, and I was like, "How am I not scarred for life from this?" Yeah, I think a lot of British kids were scarred for life. You know, Christmas favorite. Um, no, uh, I don't no, know. they used to put it on at Easter. <laughs> because they're rabbits, rabbit. right? <laughs> <laughs> Did oh, they not oh. actually watch the content? Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably not. 
So what was interesting is that a couple of years ago, they did a remake on the BBC of Watership Down, which wasn't very good, to be honest. It kind of, you know, took away from some things. Uh, but um, they put that on over Easter and the BBC got absolutely ripped apart for it because parents were like, I, I think the parents well, it's didn't, a fun know, CGI rabbit film. Didn't, didn't know of the first one, which is unheard of in this country. Everyone knows what Watership Down is. Everyone's been traumatised by it. So it was really weird that people go, oh, I thought it was a nice rabbit film when I sat my kid down to watch it. <laughs> and then all these rabbits <laughs> just start killing and the murdering Yeah, happened. Surprise! Um, I think did else, you guys I mean, ever oh, watch... Sorry, go on. Oh, I so said, did you guys ever watch David the Gnome? What? No. I, no, I don't know what that is. This is new so, information. Okay, so this is... So um, David the Gnome is actually a TV series, and it must be an American one. I haven't really researched it too much, but... Um, basically it's a gnome and his wife and he's like a, a veterinarian for animals. And in the actual series, they state that gnomes will only live to be 400 years old and that's it. And David and his wife both know they only have like a year left to live. So they go through this entire series, they build up everything. And at the end and the last, um, at, at the very end of the series, him and his wife go to sleep in bed and don't wake up. Shit. Oh my goodness. Because he, they've oh. reached the end. <laughs> they've reached the end of their 400 year old life. So, and I grew up, I grew up watching that one. And I remember yeah. it very clearly. Like, <laughs> that's. I bet they thought that was really nice. Like they do all this stuff and then they go to sleep and then they don't wake up. Whereas a kid watches it and goes, I'm going to sleep later. What if I don't wake up? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, is that it? For I kids do stuff? have a few more. Um, um, mostly to do with stop motion. First of all. <laughs> the most so, terrifying form of motion. Yeah. Um, like, bizarrely, uh, when I watched Nightmare Before Christmas in the cinema, I loved it. Wasn't terrifying at all. You know, I wanted the soundtrack. You really couldn't get stuff like that then. So yeah. I was looking for the cassette for ages. Um, but I think... Um, I think Howard may have mentioned this before. Which yes. Is Totty, Story of a Doll's House. So, one of my favorite authors, uh, childhood authors, is uh, Ruma Godden. Uh, she usually wrote children's books about dolls. She also wrote Black Narcissus. Okay. <laughs> Totty is about a small doll and her adopted doll family who dream of having a lovely house to live in instead of a shoebox. Uh, which sounds very heartwarming, but it also involves a narcissistic doll called March Payne and some fairly tragic things happening. So you'll have to look this up. But um, they made a TV series of it with stop motion dolls and it's just like very unsettling. Yeah, so that's one of them. Um, the other one, which really upsets me when I think about it, and I'll get back to you in a second because my computer's frozen, um, is The Sandman. Yeah. So that is about sort of demonic bird that comes into a child's house at night and steals his eyeballs to feed to its baby birds in the nest and i saw it at a museum and i've forgotten who directed it now because my computer's frozen as i said uh chris is just helping me out for a second so we'll probably take this bit out later <laughs> I don't know why it's doing that. Not helpful. <laughs> uh, directed by Paul Barry. Yes, it's Paul Barry. Thank you very much, Crystal. Um, yeah, so I saw it at a museum. And um, we were there on a school trip. So we were quite young at the time. Uh, this was in the early 90s. And they had it on a CRT like television mm. um in the middle of this other like you know thing for exhibition stuff and like we just all sort of stood watching it and afterwards it was kind of like huh like because it's literally this this really scary but you can watch it on youtube but i strongly recommend that you don't because you probably won't sleep um it's really horrible isn't it I, I it's horrible i i it's, loved it <laughs> it's, it's it, if i was a kid who watched bad, it i would hate yeah. it I now feel really bad, like, because I was playing, before I went to sleep last night, a game called Little Nightmares, and now think about it, it has the same energy. <laughs> oh, so that's why I had weird dreams last night. Oh, it's such, a, it's such a good game. It's asleep, so, it's, it's actually music. really beautiful in its own right. Um, but that's another discussion for another day. Once I've... I think the main point is that there's a running theme in these things. It's like, I think back when you watch things 
and you would talk about having seen it and it was hard to like you you didn't have the evidence because obviously VHS was relatively new you didn't have the internet that's what makes things seem yeah because you couldn't kind of like debunk more these mystic. things yeah like I was gonna say that I was concerned about gremlins for a while so I was yeah. about nine or ten and I'd seen part of the gremlins movie at a play scheme one summer actually because the older children put it on we had a video room um they didn't supervise the older children with videos in in the rec room so um i hadn't seen the entire first movie uh when i moved house with my mother we were sharing a room for a while and we had a small tv opposite the bed uh on the night we tried to watch gremlins on tv the signal kept screwing up um so old crt tv again with an aerial in the late 90s and at the end of the movie, so you get the warning voiceover from the dad that if your your TV goes on the fritz, you might have a gremlin in the house. So we turned the lights out to go to sleep and I just thought, oh shit, <laughs> it's a fucking gremlin. Um, I think... Uh, it's just ridiculous because gremlins... It is ridiculous. Gremlins yeah. turned up in a, in, a, in a more recent, in the last 10 years, they turned up as part of an advertising campaign by British Telecom. It was BT, yeah. It was BT. And it was basically about like... They were the, tech support. They were the tech support. <laughs> they were like, hello. Oh, uh, no, that was mental. <laughs> I really found that funny. Um, gremlins are ridiculous oh, right. now. <laughs> and our nephew's are obsessed now, apparently, with gremlins, only because my sister has told him about Mogwais and gremlins. He's well, not seen anything. The problem is she didn't tell him about Mogwais. That was the mistake that she made. Oh, so fool. they were walking past a shop in York city center and they had a, you know, a gizmo toy. And he was obviously interested in this like fluffy cute thing also because he's been watching the Mandalorian and you know, he's, he likes Grogu. So it's kind of a similar look, isn't it? So we said, who's that? What's that? Um, so he's only four. And um, she said, that's a gremlin. So she told us about this and we were like, but that's not a gremlin, Zoe. That's, that's a mogwai. And but then she 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 tried to explain. Oh yes, well he turns into a gremlin if you uh, if you throw water on him. And he's obviously as a four year old, he's very intrigued by this little creature. And now she's shown him like the trailer on YouTube where they like gets put in the blender or something. Oh he's like, Go no! Chopped up in the blender. It's great. <laughs> oh my sister's the worst. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Like I don't know. I mean, clearly she understands what he's he, he's he's more than capable of processing the Mandalorian, and there's some scary things in that show. Yeah, and he's perfectly happy with Greek myths and legends. So I guess gremlins are like you know, if you have a gremlin infestation, you'd only all you need is my nephew to make some. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he can bodge together some like you know rudimentary equipment to uh to, to root out your gremlin infestation well, he's, he's already been on you watch like ghostbusters he knows ghostbusters yeah yeah so <laughs> he also said the most terrifying like he's also said like the, what's the most terrifying no, equally the most the most folk horror yet terrifying thing he has ever said is because it was it do with the what's the time mr wolf oh yeah he plays no he plays either like three little pigs oh yeah where you have to be the wolf or he has to be the wolf and you have to hide in the house and he blows it down and runs after you yeah um or what's the time mr wolf where you kind of you take footsteps and you count down and he comes to get you um and has obviously talked about red riding hood with his dad so it's you know like the, the big bad wolf yeah. So there was this period where it was like this phase of talking about the big bad wolf and things. And they were walking in a park like near the forest. And um like, you know, I, I don't know what it is that they saw or something, but you know, some I was, like a, yeah. Yeah, and, and he said it was the big bad wolf. I should have killed him last night. <laughs> like, what the <laughs> heck is this kid on? <laughs> like he he is not telling us about the fey creatures he's seen. Yeah, should have killed him last night. That is hilarious. I kids are kids are amazing when it comes to the things that they say and um I've had a couple as a teacher where I'm like wait what did you say <laughs> I <laughs> bet. You that? like do I need to get some salt or like some sort of sage or something <laughs> um so. So what are we ending with? Um, well, I was going to say about Nightmare, because you're a big fan of oh, Nightmare. Oh, Nightmare's so... a classic. Um, I don't know if you've seen any of this, Crystal. So, and this is like, is... It's a this, children's this... game show. Yeah, and it's so ripe for 
being rebooted really they have done one for like an anniversary edition i think they've done it they may have done it at uk games expo as well but basically Traegar is the is the um is like effectively the dungeon master and you get some school kids in a team that come on the show there's four of them three are the ones that stay in the main command center we'll say in the tower who are looking through a mystic ball aka television screen and they're doing all the puzzly stuff and have to do the spell casting and and so forth and then their friend has put on a helmet which they can't see jack shit except for their feet basically because they're off walking in an environment which is clearly one big giant green screen and so everything you see has the green screen like filled in with like tunnels and dungeons and environments and um and like so they can't so the person in that environment can't see what they're doing or where they should move so their friends who can see who are in front of the tv screen are telling where to go but also there are characters they interact with in these environments played by actors just weird actors in costumes and weird ass actors really primitive yeah. digital effects on this dungeon crawl and and i saw repeats of it on tv and it's like nostalgic, but also really foreboding. Like the 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 intro cartoon sequence is really quite something quite synth wavy horror about the is artwork. It like Prince Valiant kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, it's a classic. And then also, obviously, the person dies, and they're like, take a step forward when they shouldn't, and then they animate them dropping to their death some way. Like yeah, like so. Yeah, if you hole. fail the task and you die, you're not seen again at all. Or you know, a buzzsaw dead. cuts you yeah, in half like, so, or something. So I, I think that little kids would watch it and go, wow, he's dead? Harsh. Like, he's dead. <laughs> yeah, then you see him a moment later and they walk off waving in, as they go into the sunset having Yeah, failed. and you're like, hang on, I thought he was dead. So when you see them go into the sunset, you're like, is he in heaven? So yeah, if, if, you, <laughs> if you haven't ever seen this, because this is a very British thing, then look it up because it's like fantastic. <laughs> Um, we'll have to look that up. So the last one that's ingrained in everyone's brains is... Uh... Animals of Farthing Wood. So that's, it's quite notorious, at least amongst British children. So I remember watching it on afternoons after primary school. All my friends watched it. Um, on the face of it, it's a nice story about woodland animals. <laughs> um, their home is under threat and they have to reach the safety of White Deer Park. But it's actually really cutthroat. The writers don't pretend that the animals are all friends. There's a lot of conflict between different species, rivalry and like predation. So it does a good job of teaching about nature. There's like, you know, death or more than one death every episode, often quite a horrific one. The one that everyone does talk about is the baby mice. So they're carried through the air by a shrike, dropped onto thorns and impaled. And you see all this. So while the parent mice are actually watching. So um, I started making a list and then I found someone had already done a list the list of is the, bad. Of the death count. So that's actually how I'm going to basically finish the podcast <laughs> to read the death count from Animals oh and Farthing Wood. So um, let me just scroll oh, down God. to find this. I can't believe someone made this into a podcast. They did. They did it in a series of tweets in a, in a tweet tweet thread thing. Oh. So um, this was a guy called Ben at uh, Bilbo nine eight three on Twitter. <laughs> And he said, I've rewatched The Animals of Farthing Wood. Here's the horrific casualty list in full. Brace yourself. So one of 13. <laughs> um, so the Newt family are burned to death. What? Mrs. Oh Pheasant my gosh. is shot, cooked, and presumably eaten. <laughs> Mr. Pheasant is shot dead whilst recording in horror at the sight of his roasted wife's carcass. Oh. Baby rabbit is nearly strangled in a snare. The rabbit family almost drown in a river. The rabbit's almost drowned fox who is swept down river. Mole is almost eaten by a pike. Three baby mice are murdered by a shrike bird who impels them on spikes as their parents are forced to watch. Um, it gets better. Fox and vixen are almost hounded to death by a pack of ravenous dogs. Toad is almost eaten alive by a carp. Baby rabbit is shot dead by poachers in front of his parents and sister. Mr. and Mrs. Hedgehog are squashed to death on a motorway while paralysed by fear. Wow, I remember that one. Yeah, and these are not implied, you see all this. So, Mrs. Fieldmouse is murdered and eaten by Kestrel within minutes of both of them arriving at White Deer Park. Yeah. You're just like, Kestrel, why? Um, Cat is savaged by Kestrel when she thinks he is attacking Mole. Mrs. Vole is eaten by Scarface Fox. 
Kestrel is mauled by Cat in revenge. <clears throat> it continues. Cat <laughs> is attacked by Badger to protect Kestrel. Mr. Vol dies of hypothermia. <laughs> Two deers and a blue fox are shot dead by poachers. Mole dies of old age slash hypothermia. Dreamer the fox cub is murdered by Scarface. Mrs. Hare is murdered and eaten by Scarface. Shadow the badger's paw is mangled in a trap. Bold the fox's eye is mangled by barbed wire. Bold is shot by a farmer. Fox instructs Adder to murder Scarface. She murders Scarface's son by mistake. Scarface bites Adder's tail off in revenge. Adger dies of old age. Fox and Scarface tear strips off each other. Mrs. Rabbit is murdered and eaten by Scarface. Scarface is murdered by Adder. Bold dies of his injuries. The Great White Stag dies after drinking water contaminated by toxic waste. Jesus Christ! A rabbit also <laughs> dies from the toxic waste. Trey the Stag tries to drown Shadow, who then almost dies from the toxic waste. An angry elderly donkey attempts to kill Weasel, Measly, Cleo and Fido. Still going, by the way. <laughs> Wild cats try to kill and eat the entire weasel family. The foxes, badgers, and adders start launching killing raids on the rats' headquarters, killing at least six each. Fido and Cleo almost drown. A wildcat tries to eat Measly. Rollo saves him by trying to drown the wild the wildcat, but almost drowns himself in the process. Owl is encased in cement. What on earth? Sinuous the adder is murdered by the rats. The rats try to murder Toad. Twelve squirrels <laughs> die no. in a hurricane. God. Shadow is crushed and seriously injured by a falling tree in the hurricane. Fourteen frogs killed in the hurricane. Trey is seriously injured by a falling tree. Hundreds of rats are killed in a final battle with the other animals. Conclusion, this is one of the greatest children's shows ever made, but it's no wonder many of my generation are screwed Holy up. Holy fuck. Oh I only God. mostly watched like half that series. Yeah. Wow. It's like a battle royale. Yep. That pulls no punches. That kids show. Wow. That's. So I, I thought I thought it was good to list those for the end of this podcast for the people <laughs> who remember or think they remember, but realize there's quite a lot that they didn't remember the about animals. The cement is yep. up That's there the as the most insane. Gosh. The owl encased in cement. Oh my gosh. Really horrific. Well, so Disney, if you're looking for a show to remake <laughs> with your wonderful CGI, how about looking at Animals of Farthing Wood? I dare you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's quite ahead of its time with environmental issues. And yeah, yeah, and yeah. Dangers, you know, I think that's why they made it so graphic, you know, is to see, you know, what's happening to these animals. Wow. Right. <laughs> On that happy note um yeah right. um if you enjoy this podcast if you enjoy uh dread cassette we'll be back with more dread cassette when we uh pick out another theme and look at other media and movies and tv and books and discuss uh some theme in horror and terror and uh that kind of thing um obviously if you uh have any questions uh, email darkerdaysradio at gmail.com you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at darkerdaysradio you can find us on Facebook Dark Days Radio. you can also join us on our Discord and talk about these things and how they're likely going to inspire most probably your RPG sessions at some point um, because now you've got inspiration of how to TPK your party um, if you are interested in 40k stuff and Warhammer stuff you can listen to our Darkhammer episodes uh yeah i was going to say that i recently made a twitter for the dread cassette uh, uh which is at dread cassette and there you can put any suggestions for me on future shows or things to discuss or anything from this show that you think i missed we could always do a sequel of childhood fears well, because there's a lot of stuff that's going on here i think we got through the worst of it with that last jesus christ challenge accepted <laughs> oh man uh i think the only way the only way actually i i missed a trick the only way to have ended that entire like kill count was to have done a traeger Ooh, nasty um from nightmare <laughs> that would have been perfect um yeah so i think that's the end of the episode isn't it so we'll say goodbye and we'll be back with more Dark Days Radio Dread Cassette and other episodes from the Dark Days Radio podcast, house, studio, whatever. So goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.